Welcome to Church Chat. Today we are delighted and honoured to welcome the Rector for the National Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham in England, Monsignor John Armitage. Welcome to Scotland, Monsignor. Thank you. It's a great honour to be here. It's wonderful to be here. And on a nice sunny day in Scotland. Well, that's a very rare thing up here occasionally, isn't it? <laughs> of course, so the, the Shrine at Walsingham is, is well known in, in some circles in England and amongst Catholics, but for Scottish Catholics in particular, not many would know what Walsingham is. Um, can you maybe kind of explain to the people watching what actually is the Shrine? Sure. <coughs> um, well, Walsingham is the... Um, the National Shrine to Our Lady in England. And the National Shrines are those places of special devotion to Our Lady in each country. Now, Walsingham um, was pre-Reformation, one of the great shrines of Christendom. Walsingham uh, linked with, uh, with Rome, Jerusalem and Compostela as the four great um, pilgrim centers of Europe. The story of Walsingham is very simple, is that there was a woman um, who was the lady of the manor. Her name was Richeldis. And Richeldis had a great devotion to the Mother of God. And she wanted to do something to honour our Blessed Lady. And um, so she prayed to be able to do something. And Our Lady made herself known to Richeldis and asked her to build a replica of the Holy House of Nazareth. Now this is the house where Our Lady lived with St Joachim and St Anne. And of course, where the Annunciation took place. And so, um, it, as it says in the story, that um, Richeldis was taken in spirit to Nazareth to see the Holy House. And when she came back to Walsingham, um, her plan was to build the house. Now, she got her builders together and, and um, <clears throat> they started to build, but it wouldn't work. They couldn't get it in the right place. They couldn't get it together. It, something wasn't right and so she was anxious about what to do so she prayed and one night she spent this night in prayer and during that night in prayer when the next morning when she came back the house had been moved and the building had been complete there you go. and as it was known our lady was the chief architect she's the chief architect of Walsingham <clears throat> and so this holy house was built and the message was very very simple uh, the message of our lady to the people of England at that moment in time, because every apparition of Our Lady is always a moment in time um, with a particular message. And the message at the time was, share my joy in the Annunciation. Share my joy that the Word became flesh and lived among you. Share my joy that my Son has become your Saviour. And so the significance of Walsingham was the significance of the Holy House. And the Holy House then became a centre of pilgrimage. And very slowly, the numbers of people came along. And the care of the shrine was passed um, to the canons of St Augustine. And they built um, <coughs> the Grand Priory of Walsingham which was in the heart of the village of Walsingham. Now, Vill Walsingham is in North Norfolk. It's in a very, very remote part of England. Um, people say, well, you know, lots of remote places. Well, in Norfolk is particularly remote because there are very few major roads at all. In fact, from going west, it's two hours before you get to a, a dual carriageway. It's remote then, yeah. So it's remote. And um, so the pilgrims came on foot <coughs> and um, the, it grew and grew and grew, and then it got royal patronage. Um, and from the time of um, uh, King um, uh, Henry III, um, almost every pilgrim, uh, every king or queen of England came on pilgrimage, including um, Henry VIII, who came twice um, with uh, Catherine of Aragon. And so there was this, it was a very much a royal, in fact, there is also a very, story of one of the uh, one of the Bruces from Scotland coming on pilgrimage to Walsingham 
and we know it because he had to ask for safe passage from the from the from the English border, <laughs> which had to be given by the English king for him to come. But he came with his court to Walsingham. So we had there has always been a, 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 that connection there, and indeed we still do have some pilgrimage yeah. uh, groups come from Scottish parishes. Um, so. The shrine grew and grew and grew. Uh, after about a hundred years or so, um, the Franciscan, the conventual Franciscans came. It was one of their earliest foundations and they founded a friary to look after the pilgrims. So they came from all over and it became one of the great pilgrimage centres. At the Reformation, um, the, the tragedy of the Reformation was such that the shrine was destroyed. Now it's at this point we have a slight um, issue. Now the issue is that um, the statue that had been in the church, which you see here behind me, is the statue of Our Lady of Walsingham. Um, but the statue is not the message of the shrine. If you look at the Lady of Lourdes, she was part of the story. If you look at Our Lady of Fatima, the statue is part of what they saw. The statue of Our Lady of Walsingham doesn't arrive until a hundred years after the apparition. And she's essentially just a local East Anglian representation of our Blessed Lady. And one of the interesting things, when you see her at the bottom, you can't see it here, but at the feet, um, we hear in the scriptures that the virgin crushed the head of the serpent. Well, there weren't any serpents in England. All right? um, not wriggling about on the floor anyway. And uh, so the symbol of evil was the toad. So you see in the statues of Our Lady, Our Lady crushes the toad. <clears throat> so this statue then is just a local representation, but this is the statue that's taken to London to be burned, and to be burned along with Penrice, a Lady of Penrice, a Lady of Doncaster, and various other great medieval English uh, statues of Our Lady. Well, why didn't they go to London and not burn them on the spot? Because the 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 great event these were political events yeah. Symbolism of so the symbol yeah. so the martyrs were rarely martyred in their homes they were taken to london york um, oxford cambridge norwich yeah, <coughs> to be an attention to draw attention to what was happening right. uh -huh. so they were taken and they were burned in the garden of uh, st thomas more's old house in chelsea which is now very happily where the london seminary is at allen hall so that was the end. The shrine was destroyed. Um, the buildings were pulled down. The only thing that was left is one mile outside of the village is a small chapel called the Slipper Chapel. And it's where the pilgrims stopped, took their shoes off, went to confession, and then walked barefoot for the last mile. And it's called the Holy Mile. And they walked down to the shrine. That wasn't destroyed because it was just too small. And so it became a cow shed. And it remained as a cow shed until about the um, 1890s um, when a Catholic woman called Charlotte Boyd um, bought it and restored it to Catholic use. The small chapel was given to the monks of Downside, um, but it was too far away. It was the other side of the country for them to look after. So they gave it to the Diocese of Northampton, who eventually became part of the Diocese of East Anglia, which it is today. So from the, the late 1890s, there was a, a, a small but significant chapel um, for Catholic use. Now, the problem then, of course, was that um, the, the church in, in England was restoring itself. And, uh, you know, the Northampton Diocese had lots of building projects. They really couldn't take on. So Walsingham became fairly quiet. There were pilgrimages and some very big pilgrimages of up to 10,000 people because in those days there was a train station right outside the Slipper Chapel. Sadly, no more. Dr. Beeching got rid of all uh, use, useful train stations out in the country. Um, but there had still had big pilgrimages. But the, there wasn't, the, there wasn't the, the, the infrastructure to receive these pilgrimages. One of the significant links for us um, and the National Shrine to Our Lady of Lourdes in Scotland at Carfin was what happened for the, the solemn opening of Carfin, which was done by the Archbishop of Westminster, Cardinal Bourne. Yeah. 
and Cardinal Bourne was invited and there were great celebrations in Carfin. And on his way back down to London, he thought to himself, well, there is now a national shrine to Our Lady in Scotland. We need to have a national shrine to Our Lady in Walsingham. Good connection between the two shrines. And it's a great connection between the two shrines. And so he then in the 1930s established Walsingham as the national shrine to Our Lady. Um, and there was one very large um, pilgrimage, but then uh, shortly after that, you know, was the run into the Second World War. And the area was closed down completely as a secure area for troops. And so the shrine was closed again, apart from just local people could get to it, but nobody could publicly get into the area. After the war, it begins then again, and the shrine has grown in size and strength and the infrastructure to accept pilgrims from all over the world. So now um, between 250 and 300,000 people come to Walsingham in one way, shape or form as tourists and pilgrims, large numbers of pilgrimages. Um, and it reflects very much the universal nature of the church with the different you know, uh, ethnic groups who come. What would be the best way to get to Walsingham for someone up in Scotland, for example? Would it be via London or? Flight. Um, the you can fly to Norwich, mm, right. and then Norwich is about an hour. That's not too bad. But there are from the from the east coast of Scotland, there are lots you can go from Aberdeen and and, and um, um, Edinburgh, Edinburgh. <coughs> directly to Norwich. It's quite a drive, isn't it? As well, it's, really a, it's a long drive. It's yeah. a long drive, or if you come by train, you go down on the uh, east coast route to Grantham or one of those stations and then you can get across country to Ely and then a train from Ely up to Kings Lynn and then taxi from Kings Lynn. And if there's going to be like bus tours or things coming from other places, is oh, there yeah. accommodation for people? There's accommodation, we have a hostel, a newly refurbished hostel for up to 120 pilgrims and um, you know so there's plenty, it's also a beautiful part of the country. Um, people come because they are in turmoil they come because they've fallen in love, they come because their child has been born, they come because their mother is ill, they come because they're trying to discern their vocation in life, they come because they're frightened, because they're anxious about the world, they come because their loved one has died, or as many reasons as there are for human emotions, they come at a shrine. And this is a really, that's why they're so important. And for many people who may be distanced from the church, may be lapsed or just have stopped going to Mass, for whatever reason, a shrine can be a first step in raising a question. Raising a question within themselves. And that's really why they're so important. You know, if you're alienated from your parish, um, going on a pilgrimage, takes you out of your normal everyday life. Yeah. It takes you into a different context. It gives you a different view on things. Um, <clears throat> and one of the most important things that the church tries to do, which is what our faith helps us to do, is to see the bigger picture. Yeah. Right? The bigger picture puts things into perspective. At the moment, I'm suffering, and I'm almost defined by my suffering. The difficulties I'm going through at the moment, I can't see anything else. Well, what faith does is it helps us to see the bigger picture. Always, it's about the bigger picture. And the name for the bigger picture is Jesus Christ. If we see him, we discover two things. The discovery of Jesus, the discovery of God, is the same as the discovery of my true self. In discovering one, I discover the other. Yeah. As I discover God, it is because I've tr discovered my true self. My true self as God created me to be. And in shrines, because we don't have the pressures of our ordinary everyday life, because for, even just for a couple of hours, stepping back, isn't it? we're just stepping back, you know, and you're just reflecting. They are powerful places in a crazy and chaotic world to make a difference. And so you very often see it, particularly with young people, you know, who, who may go to Lourdes, who come to Walsingham, who may go, you know, very often they go, they go kicking and screaming, you know, 
maybe because their parish priest has said to them all to go, or their mates have said they're going to go, or their mum and dad said, look, you know, do you want to go? And they said, well, I will see. And in the end, they are kicking and screaming, but they're kicking and screaming about leaving the place oh, yeah. because it's had such an impact on you them. You see that? And you also see them meet up with future partners as well. And they want to go back, them. and they want to go back. Mm. You know? It's, it's, it's a natural bringing together in a joyful environment. And the joyful environment won't give us anything, but it will ask everything from us. And because we then give, we then know the cause of our joy. Of course, in, in 2009, uh, Walsingham was one of the sites where the relics of St. Teresa of Lisieux came to. So it's almost yeah. like a kind of reverse pilgrimage instead of like going to Lisieux, Lisieux is coming to us. Yes. So obviously it's a big year for us in Scotland at the end of the year, the end of the, you know, August, end of the summer, the relics will be coming here. What was your insight from that, that time in 2009? What, what do you think we'll expect to see? Um, well, there's a great book by, uh, I think, C.S. Lewis called Surprised with Joy. Or Surprised by Joy. And that's what happened to us in England. We were surprised by the sheer number of people, thousands of people, who just turned up. And you kind of ask, why would so many people of such a remarkable um, selection of society come to experience something that is, um, you know, it's the relics of someone who's died, someone who's a saint. Um, but across the board, you know, from when she, she one of the m most moving moments was her visit to a young offenders prison in West London and the impact it had on the young men, the young offenders there. But across the board, you know, cures and, and a real sense of peace and hope. Why, did, why is it that St. Therese brings out people so much? I beyond, think... Beyond the church itself. Yeah, no, well. yeah, no, yeah, uh, indeed. Um, I think because we live in an incredibly complex society. We live in a society that is quite dysfunctional, where the, the pillars of, um, you know, a, a good life um, seem to be ignored or ridiculed. And so because of that, because of that lack of, of a formation, a, a foundation of life that we can trust, <clears throat> people end up trusting all sorts of inappropriate things. You know, the great G.K. Chesterton said, when people stop believing in God, it's not that they believe in nothing. When people stop believing in God, they will believe in anything. And I think what we see today is people trusting anything, yeah. trusting things that, you know, that, that just lead us to despair. And so therefore, in this complicated and chaotic world, um, where the, the, the consequences of this chaos is, is, is such suffering in our world, personal suffering. Here we have a young girl who was only in the convent for 14 years, um, who has a very simple message. And it is that we do the ordinary, everyday things, the little things, which we can all do, um, is that we do them with great love. And it's such a simple message. You know, we look at the things in our life, we think that's too big for me to do. Well, it's too big for me to do in one step, but it's not too big for me to do in small steps. So to do small things with great love is possible for everyone. And when you look at the little way of St. Teresa, that's really what she's talking about. And what's fascinating is, um, you know, there are certain um, titles in the church, and one of them are of the great thinkers, the great theologians, the great men and women of God who helped the church to understand. And they're called doctors of the church. And they're great people like um, St. Thomas Aquinas, um, St. Albert the Great, Catherine of Siena, all these great people. 
who are doctors of the church. But quite remarkably, little Teresa became a doctor of the church with these great theologians, quite simply because of her little way. She helped us to understand the significance that life is possible by taking it one step at a time, by trusting God, and by realising that all things are possible with the help of God's grace. And don't, don't be afraid. And she gives us the message to trust in providence, to trust in God. And so I think when you start to look at Teresa's message, which is so easy to understand, um, it helps us to take a look at these big things in life that kind of stop us. So, for example, I ask you to go from, from Edinburgh to London in one step. My answer. <laughs> and, your, and your answer would be, I suspect, <laughs> uh, no, walking. I'm walking well, yeah. One step. You'd say, well, I, I couldn't do it in one step. And I say, I'll give you a million pounds. Well, I still couldn't do it. You can give as much as you like. I can't do it in one step. Yeah. Now, for many people, when they're faced with a big problem, that's, they become paralysed. I can't do it. I can't forgive. I can't stop drinking. I can't change these bad habits. I can't leave this to start and do this. Huh? I can't do it. And it's like saying, go from here to Edinburgh to London in one step. You can't do it. If I say to you, can you go from Edinburgh to London in as many steps as it takes? You'd say, well, yes, I could do that, but I'd need help. You say, OK, fine. Um, what would you, well, you, but you could do it, yes. But would you need a good pair of boots? Well, yeah, but you could do it. Yes, I could do it. But you, would you need a map? Well, yeah, I'd need a map, but you could do it. Yeah, would you need a place to stay on the way? Well, yes, but I, I could do it. Um, in other words, it becomes possible, but it only becomes possible a step at a time. Do small things with great love and you transform yourself and you transform the world. Teresa in her obscure provincial Carmelite convent, which almost nobody knew about, in her entire life there. It wasn't till she died that she really became known when <clears throat> she wrote the famous book, The Autobiography of a Soul. <clears throat> Teresa, in her life, did nothing remarkable that people saw. But afterwards they began to realise that it was these small things that she did that transformed her into a saint. <clears throat> Remember the definition of a saint is someone who is close to God and who makes God real and close to others. That's what Teresa did for us. She was close to God. And in that small, obscure way, she came close to God so that I too can become close to God by following her simple footsteps of doing small things with great love. That message is a message that's understood by everyone. It's not complicated. I can't walk from here to Edinburgh in one step, but in as many steps as it takes, I can do it. In fact, in as many steps of faith as it takes, I can do whatever God wants me to do. That's Teresa's message. And that's what we're hoping will reunite the whole Catholic scene here in Scotland. You know, it's going to bring so much hope this year when we get the dates organised and released for people to see. But I'd like to thank you very much for coming here today and having a short reflection about Walsingham and St. Teresa. It was very insightful. And, and we encourage everyone who's watching, especially maybe those who are in England, who may want to follow the dowry tour, which is taking place just now. We'll post details about that on this post. And also look out in the coming months and weeks for more information about the relics tour of St. Therese of you at the end of summer. It's going to be good. It's going to be excellent. Be there. And we hope everyone will be there. Thanks very much and God bless.